All right, everyone, welcome to lecture 1-1 on the neck and the visceral portion of uh, this anatomy neuroscience course. So we've already discussed some portions of the neck, the suboccipital triangle and the posterior region deep to the trapezius muscle. And we understand the borders, boundaries of this region, and we understand uh, the importance of this region in that it contains the vertebral artery. The vertebral artery enters foramen magnum to uh, supply a large portion of the brain through the circle of Willis. Uh, we, we've seen the uh, greater occipital nerve, which provides uh, sensation to the back of the head along with the uh, lesser uh, and third occipital nerves uh, in this region. And so um, here we see that vertebral artery as it takes its curve and pierces the uh, atlanto-occipital membrane in the posterior portion of the neck, so this posterior view. So uh, all of that is old hat. We've seen that. We've done that. So now we're going to talk about the rest of the neck, the anterior and the posterior portion, the side of the neck. <clears throat> so first off, fascias of the neck. The uh, relationship of the fascia with the musculature in the neck and the face is very interesting because these superficial muscles, the muscles of facial expression in the face and the platysma in the neck, are actually not attached to bones. They, uh, their attachments are in this connective tissue. So platysma muscle within the neck is actually muscular fibers uh, associated with the connective tissue of the neck. And you can see this picture here how these nice long platysma fibers are actually located within the um, membranous fascia, deep to the fatty superficial fascia. Then we have uh, below that fascia and below deep to platysma, we have the investing layer of fascia, the deep investing membranous fascia, which surrounds the musculature of the neck. So uh, the neck itself, the internal compartments of the neck, are divided up by a number of different fascial layers. So in this slide we've taken uh, an axial section through the neck. We can see the vertebral body uh, and the spinous and transverse processes along with the spinal cord in the middle. So anterior is up, posterior is down because we see the trachea and the esophagus as well as the, uh, the um, uh, thyroid gland. So as we look at these different layers of fascia that surround these structures, we can see that they will divide the neck up into different compartments. First, the deep investing fascia is going to surround the infrahyoid muscles as well as sternocleidomastoid and trapezius in the posterior region. So that investing layer will create one large compartment uh, of the deeper structures of the neck. <clears throat> then we will have a pretracheal fascia. Pretracheal fascia surrounds the trachea esophagus and the thyroid gland. Uh, this pretracheal layer creates the anterior compartment of the neck, which contains those structures. Next, we have the prevertebral layer that covers the vertebral bodies as well as the intrinsic uh, muscles of the back and neck. So those muscles are like the scalenes, uh, lung ipsis coli, um, and the rectus muscles uh, of the rectus capitis, posterior and anterior muscles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so that pre-vertebral layer forms the posterior compartment of the neck that contains all of those structures. Then we have the vascular compartment, which is formed by the carotid sheath. The carotid sheath is a uh, layer of connective tissue that surrounds the, um, the uh, carotid artery, the vagus nerve, and the internal jugular vein. So making up the vascular compartments. So here we see a more anatomically accurate pre or precise or, or um, descriptive drawing of these fascial layers. We can see the investing fascia of the neck, also called the cervical investing fascia. Uh, and how it surrounds uh, various structures. First off, we have the carotid sheath surrounding internal jugular and the carotid arteries as well as the vagus nerve. The 
tracheal fascia you can see here on the thyroid cartilage surrounding all of those structures, the pharynx, larynx, esophagus, uh, and trachea more inferiorly, and the thyroid gland around the thyroid cartilage. And in the prevertebral fascia, we will see here in the posterior compartment of the neck on top of the scalene muscles. Uh, so those are locations where you can actually identify those. Now there's an important area formed by these uh, fascial layers. It's actually a potential space where uh, layers of this fascia do not come together. So as we head inferiorly, we can see that the prevertebral fascia is actually going to uh, possibly split and form what's called the alar fascia and the prevertebral fascia. So that divide is continuous from the base of the skull all the way down to the diaphragm. So think about that, from the base of the skull down to the diaphragm, that is a pretty large, tall space <clears throat> formed by these fascial layers. And so the danger of this space, why it's called the danger space, is that infections, for instance, infections of the, um, uh, the middle ear cavity or of the tonsils, the pharynx, can pass easily through, fairly, relatively easily, not, not like instantly, but you know, relatively easily between these layers and build up inside this space, uh, isolated and protected from the, um, the lymphatic systems of the body. Once it gets into this space from uh, higher up in the pharynx, it can travel all the way down to the, to the diaphragm uh, behind the heart. So infections in this region can actually impact the heart and travel into the heart and uh, enter this, the uh, systemic circulation. Uh, so uh, this potential space is visible on radiographic imaging, uh, which is a way to uh, diagnose infections in this area. So very important uh, if infections spread uncontrolled, uh, that can be the result. So we've also already talked about the posterior triangle of the neck. We know the borders, we know the contents, the scalenes, the brachial plexus, the phrenic nerve, and the accessory nerve are found in, in the posterior triangle of the neck. So you can see that here, revisiting that. But what we're mostly interested in this lecture is the anterior triangle of the neck. The anterior triangle is from the mandible down to the sternocleidomastoid, the anterior border of sternocleidomastoid as it uh, descends to the uh, manubrium of the sternum. So this triangle we can further subdivide into additional triangles. So here we see in blue, below the hyoid bone, is the muscular triangle. Uh, you can see what it contains. One of the important structures is the branches of ansa cervicalis. We'll talk about ansa cervicalis. It's a uh, small nerve plexus that provides motor innervation to these muscles in the neck. So that's a critical uh, element of the neck uh, anatomy. Then we also have the submandibular, also called the digastric triangle. We can see that here encompassing the posterior belly of the digastric, stylohyoid, and the, um, the mylohyoid uh, muscles there up to the lateral border of the anterior belly of digastric, which uh, is the border for the submental triangle. Submental triangle contains the uh, anterior belly of the digastric and the mylohyoid, uh, as well as the geniohyoid muscle deep uh, to it. So those are collectively called suprahyoid muscles because they're above the hyoid. The uh, muscles below the hyoid bone in the uh, muscular triangle are called the uh, collectively the infrahyoid muscles. Sometimes you'll hear them called strap muscles as well because they're long and narrow like a strap of leather or something, you know, a rope. We also have the carotid triangle. Uh, carotid triangle contains that carotid sheath with its contents, as well as some other important landmarks. Uh, so the vagus nerve is inside there. Uh, also hypoglossal nerve is going to travel across, anterior to uh, that sheath. The ansa cervicalis that we just talked about is a, is a small, very thin plexus 
uh, that we will see embedded in on the surface of the carotid sheath. So that's an important structure to look for in dissection. Uh, so the reason we are subdividing these into different compartments or triangles is because uh, that makes understanding them a lot easier. So the uh, submandibular triangle, uh, as we mentioned, contains posterior belly and stylohyoid, and those are all innervated by cranial nerve 7, facial nerve. This will make sense once we understand the embryology in another lecture or two. The submental triangle, uh, mentum being the uh, the anterior portion of the, the chin is called the mentum, so that's why it's submental, containing the anterior belly and the mylohyoid, which are both innervated by the mandibular branch of trigeminal nerve. So, makes sense. Now, we have uh, a fun little exception here, the geniohyoid muscle, which is deep to mylohyoid. Mylohyoid kind of forms the hammock under your jaw, and deep to that hammock, above it, if we pierce through that hammock of mylohyoid, we will see a perpendicular set of muscle fibers. Those are geniohyoid. Geniohyoid are innervated by a branch of ansa cervicalis from C1. We will see that the C1 branch of ansa cervicalis will... Um, hitch a ride or, or travel along with the hypoglossal nerve briefly. So don't get them confused. Hypoglossal nerve has nothing to do with C1, but the two branches travel together briefly in the neck. And we'll I'll, uh, elucidate that more in a couple slides. So the muscular triangle is innervated by ansa cervicalis. Uh, and so there are, we'll, we'll talk about ansa cervicalis next. So these infrahyoid muscles mainly involved in depressing the hyoid, especially um, during swallowing uh, to prevent uh, boluses of food from getting into uh, the larynx. So again, this caveat, so we talked about uh, geniohyoid being innervated by C1, Thyrohyoid, shown in blue here, is also innervated by C1 of ansa cervicalis, but that C1 branch travels with hypoglossal briefly. So you may see in some, you know, uh, other textbooks that these muscles are innervated by hypoglossal nerve. They are not. Hypoglossal nerve is the cranial nerve that travels through hypoglossal canal as it exits the brainstem. These fibers are not associated with hypoglossal nerve at that point, so they are not originating from hypoglossal nerve. That's an important distinction that's not always made. <clears throat> so here, <clears throat> we are going to see that distinction clearly. So hypoglossal nerve is going to be one of the landmarks in the dissection of this region. You'll see it uh, superiorly and laterally to the hyoid bone, which will be a palpable landmark uh, within the anterior triangle of the neck. <clears throat> so hypoglossal nerve will travel deep to all of these structures uh, and enter above, superior to, the mylohyoid hammock. So you will be able to see that innervation. So the C1 superior root of ansa cervicalis, shown here in red, is not coming from hypoglossal nerve. It's coming from the anterior ramus of C1. It very briefly uh, is separate and then joins hypoglossal uh, nerve and will separate again to innervate these different muscle, muscular components. C1 loops down and joins up with the inferior root of ansa cervicalis, which comes from C2 and C3. Uh, and so those, this is why it's called ansa cervicalis because ansa cervicalis means the loop in the neck, the cervical loop. And so this plexus forms this cervical loop to innervate the infrahyoid muscles as well as geniohyoid. Uh, in this region, we'll also see labeled here phrenic nerve traveling atop of anterior scalene, as well as accessory nerve will be back here heading to trapezius. 
So that's motor innervation. What's sensory innervation of the neck? Sensory innervation is coming from Herb's point. There are four sensory nerves, purely sensory nerves, coming from Herb's point, which is behind the midpoint of the uh, SCM. So those four nerves will branch out in different directions, <clears throat> and the nerves are named for their arborization point lesser occipital because it's a smaller nerve that innervates the lower portion of the occipital region, the back of the head. We have great auricular nerve innervating the auricle, um, the inferior behind the auricle uh, and inferior to the ear. Transverse cervical heading straight across the neck uh, toward the thyroid cartilage and supraclavicular, heading down across the clavicle. And if you follow them to their extent, you'll see them actually crossing the clavicle to the pectoral region. These all come from C1 to 5. So that's uh, these nerves that form those dermatomes. When we do the dissection, ideally this is what our dissection is going to look like. We're going to open up this carotid triangle to find hypoglossal nerve. That's our main landmark next to the hyoid bone. We're going to follow that, and as we follow hypoglossal nerve, we'll find the branching of C1 to the thyrohyoid muscle. Ansa cervicalis, you can see it peeking down around here, so it actually loops around on the surface of the uh, carotid sheath. So uh, we can't just tear through the carotid sheath. We need to identify Ansa cervicalis first and separate it out, and then we can cut the carotid sheath to get the rest of these structures like vagus nerve uh, here and um, uh, you know the other components of ansa cervicalis. <clears throat> muscles we will not see but which are important the uh, deep anterior muscles of the neck behind the esophagus uh, deep to the esophagus so the longus coli muscles on the anterior surface, we also have rectus capitis muscles, anterior and lateral, and the scalenes. We will see the scalenes, but we won't be able to see their attachments to the transverse processes. Uh, so important uh, to understand these attachments because they contribute to a lot of posture issues. If the neck is, uh, you know, tilted anteriorly, uh, you know, from lots of computer use, uh, then these muscles. Uh, are contributing to that. The posterior muscles have to hold the head back, so you're getting a lot of neck pain, possibly migraines, because the semispinalis is going to impinge on the occipital nerves that travel through them, um, that travel through semispinalis. Uh, so, uh, at any rate, important, but unfortunately we don't see them in dissection very often. So next, let's look at the arterial supply of the head and neck. So, of course, we have the carotid artery, which bifurcates into the uh, external and the internal carotid artery. The internal supplies the cranium, the brain. So, it will enter into the cranium and form um, the anterior portions of Circle of Willis. Right now, we're going to talk about the blood supply to the neck and the face. So, that means looking at the external carotid artery. External carotid artery has a number of branches. We can run through these quickly. The, uh, so s typically, the order in which we uh, follow these arteries and name their branches is from anterior going back up around the face uh, to posterior and inferior again. So kind of like in a circular pattern, which may be clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on the side of the neck. So first, uh, suprathyroid artery, so here's our external carotid, a uh, suprathyroid or superior thyroid artery uh, heading to the uh, thyroid gland as well as piercing the uh, thyrohyoid membrane to supply the internal structures there, the voice box. Lingual artery is branching off next. If we're heading more superiorly, next one we'll hit is the lingual artery heading behind mylohyoid to supply the tongue. Then we have facial artery. Facial artery branches up behind the mandible and then travels uh, deep to it, or uh, below it, I mean, and then crosses over it superficially on the outside of it. So you can actually palpate the, um, your heart rate at the facial artery on the side of your mandible, and then that will branch throughout the face to supply the face. 
Um, so next we have the maxillary artery. Maxillary artery is heading deep into the deeper portions of the face behind the mandible. So this is heading into what's called the infratemporal fossa, which is a deep portion of the face. Uh, superficial uh, temporal artery is going to be heading up, you can't see it here, heading up uh, just anterior to the ear. Uh, and it's superficial. Next we have the posterior auricular, so it will branch out behind the ear uh, along with occipital next, and then ascending pharyngeal is going to um, supply the pharyngeal structures of the larynx and pharynx, and it branches off low at the bifurcation, so ascending pharyngeal right here. There's a mnemonic to remember these arteries, and the mnemonic is some little fat man stole Papa's only apple. And so if you follow those arterial branches uh, as so, then the first letter of that mnemonic, of each of those words in that mnemonic, is the first letter of the uh, respective artery. So that's how uh, we typically remember those. Uh, so now we have some other structures that supply the neck, arterial branches that supply the neck, and these are coming off of the subclavian artery. Uh, one of these uh, that's very important is the vertebral artery. So vertebral artery is only in the cervical region of the body, branches from subclavian, and travels up through the, um, the transverse foramen of the cervical vertebrae. And so that will travel through there. We, we understand it's in the suboccipital triangle, uh, you know, takes a, a sharp turn and pierces the atlanto-occipital membrane, the posterior atlanto-occipital, and uh, then enters the cranium via foramen magnum. Thyrocervical trunk also supplies a lot of structures in the inferior portion of the neck. We can see it right here. A lot of its branches are cut. It supplies the inferior portion of the thyroid gland. It has a transverse cervical artery that heads transversely backwards to supply uh, the uh, trapezius muscle. Uh, Supra-scapular uh, comes off of thyrocervical trunk. So we've heard about a lot of those. So now we understand that even more. <clears throat> the veins in the neck are also important. So we have some superficial veins. The anterior jugular veins are traveling right along on either side of the muscular com uh, compartment of the neck. Um, so <clears throat> if, for instance, the external jugular vein more laterally becomes occluded or blocked, you will see that passage uh, change and the, um, the anterior jugular vein may become distended in individuals. So it's typically the external jugular vein that takes up most of this drainage but the anterior jugular vein can facilitate uh, as well. The internal jugular vein is draining the cranium, the uh, brain. So we can see uh, here those structures more clearly, but we also are now looking at the thyroid gland, which is this endocrine secretory organ in the neck. So the thyroid gland has uh, multiple lobes. It has a right and a left lobe and an isthmus that connects them. Oftentimes you will also see a pyramidal lobe, which is this embryological remnant as the thyroid gland descended down uh, in the neck. Uh, in this region, so blood supply, we've already talked about the superior thyroid and inferior thyroid arteries. So we're highlighting those now. Uh, and uh, so venous drainage similar to the arterial supply. And then we are also looking at the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Recurrent laryngeal nerve is a branch of vagus nerve. Remember, we mentioned the vagus nerve has SVEs that innervate the voice box. So uh, these, the voice box is the intrinsic laryngeal muscles that change the pitch of our voice as we talk or sing or whatever. So this recurrent laryngeal nerve is called recurrent because it travels around the, um, the artery, the subclavian artery or the abdominal aorta. So on the left side, it branches around the abdominal aorta and ascends. On the right side, it branches below the right subclavian artery and ascends 
and it will enter, it will travel behind the thyroid gland uh, between the esophagus and the, the, um, the trachea uh, to uh, pierce the, uh, and enter the uh, larynx just inferior to the thyroid cartilage. So this is also an important nerve we need to understand because damage to this nerve happens. Uh, impingement of this nerve can happen uh, in a number of ways and that results in muscular impairment, which is a um, muscular rehabilitation uh, issue. <clears throat> One last thing, in the neck, of course, we have to talk about the sympathetics of the neck because they make up such a big component of the uh, nervous uh, structures in the neck. So uh, in the neck, we will see the superior cervical ganglion high up uh, next to the internal carotid artery because these sympathetic fibers travel along with the carotid, the internal carotid artery. Something we'll learn is that sympathetic fibers travel with the ar travel with arteries to get to the smooth muscle that they innervate. So that's how these fibers travel up into the head and uh, to innervate smooth muscle in the face. We will also see the middle cervical ganglion as well as the inferior cervical ganglion. Inferior cervical ganglion is often fused with the T1 thoracic um, uh, ganglion, sympathetic ganglion, and, and because of that they are collectively called the stellate ganglion. Uh, so these are uh, this sympathetic chain as it's called uh, with its uh, resultant ganglia are going to be posterior to the, uh, the carotid uh, compartment. So thanks for watching.